Bravo. Good evening, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I like this novel in the environment of my talks. It's very, very different from this one. I, I don't think that I ever gave a talk in a bar. So, really, but I feel very comfortable here. Anyway, I wish to thank the Center of Consumer's Choice for this kind invitation, and in particular for the efforts to get this equipment in the last minute. They were not prepared to, for a talk with slides, and I not, was not prepared for a talk without slides. Okay? So, I was asked to talk about nicotine is not your enemy, and I gave you the subtitle for Baco Harm Reduction and Reduced Risk Nicotine Products. So, it's not just electronic cigarettes, it's tobacco eating systems, it's news. I tried to convince you that that's true, that nicotine is indeed not your enemy. Well, I don't think that I have to, to explain you the terrible consequences of smoking. Just very briefly, it enhances the risk for cancer, for COPD, for a variety of respiratory diseases, for stroke and myocardial infarction, and eventually for premature death. So typically, smokers live 10 years shorter than never smokers. The smokers accept all these terrible consequences for one reason, and the reason is to get their nicotine. It was nicely illustrated in this graphic, nicotine has a very bad reputation. It's erroneously blamed by the public and by many, even many scientists. It's blamed for the, to cause these diseases that I just showed you. But none of the diseases I showed you is due to nicotine. So nicotine is a pretty, pretty benign compound. And this insight came already from, from Professor Michael Russell. He's a South African pioneer in, in smoking cessation and, and around the tobacco, tobacco field. And already 40 years ago, he said, smokers smoke for the nicotine, but they die from the top. It's a very famous citation from Michael Russell. And this insight has still not made it to the organization that is gathering um, next door in Geneva, I think. Yeah? So, Michael Russell, because of this insight, he got involved in the, in the development of nicotine replacement products. He thought he could, could treat smokers, or the dependence of smokers, by giving them nicotine in a less harmful form. And so he got involved in the, in the development of what we all know, this is the, the various uh, medicinal nicotine replacement yeah. products like gum, nicotine gum, you, you see I always find it kind of funny that they are advertised with flavors like mint or even fruit flavors, yeah? And increase your chance for, of quitting for good. So they, they advertise a combination therapy to get as much of nicotine as possible. So this is, reminds me of the Yule Epidemy in, in the United States. Well, these products are all available meanwhile and they are freely available. And my favorite place where they are available is in the United Kingdom. This I dubbed is the harm reduction shelf because a wide variety of nicotine containing products is offered just below condoms. So this is the place where you can reduce the harm from your typical daily activities. Huh? Well, so everything is fine as long as this is medicinal products. But the problems come when it when nicotine leaves pharmacies or drugstores and gets into e-liquids or other forms of, of nicotine products. So and suddenly a beneficial remedy that, that we've seen before is transformed into a hazardous toxin when e-cigarettes appear. And nobody was talking actually about the hazards of nicotine before the e-cigarettes came. Nicotine was not a topic. Every, it was clear for everybody that the combustion is the problem and not the nicotine is the problem. But here we have, have one, just one example. This is of the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse. They are residing at Columbia University in New York City, and that's what they publish. Nicotine is not harmless. It increases blood pressure, respiration, heart rate. It adversely affects nervous, cardiovascular, respiratory, and reproductive systems. It may contribute to tumor development. It can be lethally orally ingested. It's associated with poor reproductive health outcomes. I was a heavy smoker. I have four kids. <laughs> Early exposure can but okay, but not after after having switched to e-cigarettes, I, I didn't make any more. <laughs> Early exposure can produce lasting effects on brain and lung development. Okay, you say 
no wonder. Huh? <laughs> Early exposure is associated with cognitive, emotional, and behavioral deficits. Isn't that amazing? Huh? The fact that it's the use of harmful tobacco products, okay, that's fine. But it increases the risk of nicotine addiction, alcohol, and other drug use. And it's just addiction, addiction, addiction. So I detected three, three correct statements here. This was used to be red in my thing, but unfortunately they turned into black. They have always, in Spain, they had a different color. Again, they have always a different color. Nicotine is not harmless. That's an eternal truth, because nothing is harmless. Most of you are drinking beer here, or e eating finger food. I cannot promise you that this is harmless. Nothing is harmless. Even my favorite example are bananas. I cannot promise you that bananas are harmless. It increases blood pressure. Okay, that's right, but it's a, it's a mild effect. It's short-lived, it's, it's moderate, it's like caffeine or mild exercise. And it can be lethal if orally ingested. That's also an internal truth, true for everything. But all the other statements are basically wrong. I mean, smokers reproduce perfectly well. They start early. Most smokers start as teenagers. But still, they have pretty normal brains, as far as I know them. No? They behave normally, I think, and they don't end up as nicotine junkies. So what is the reason for this hostile attitude, this hostile stance against nicotine? I really don't understand it, but I try to I tried to, to, to nail down some misconceptions in public health tobacco control. And actually this is a list of eight points. It's not necessarily complete. But I'm trying to take you through this list briefly, to point, point by point. Let's start with smoking is the use of nicotine. This used to be true for decades, of course, because smoking was the most common form of nicotine use. And so it's equated still. Whenever you use nicotine, it's sort of smoking. But uh, we all know that there's a wide variety of nicotine products that is associated with substantially reduced harm. I don't have the time to show you all the data studies that clearly show that these products, like electronic cigarettes, are also serious for the tobacco heating systems, like the ICOS and for SNUS. They are all less harmful than tobacco cigarettes. It's very clear. The next point is that nicotine is highly addictive and toxic. It's, a, it's often compared with heroin in its addictive potential. Huh? But nicotine is a benign substance. It's compared to caffeine, actually. And, and this is important. I don't have the time to, show, to really debate this scientifically. But it's not toxic during normal use. It's smoking or vaping. You have to drink a large amount of nicotine-containing solutions or even better to apply it intravenously to get to get neurotoxic toxicity from nicotine. And about the, the addictive potential, cigarette dependence, and that is pretty clear, is caused by the combined action of nicotine and other constituents of tobacco smoke. So this is an, an often used as argument because ni the, the nicotine addiction or dependence. Huh? I don't have the time to debate that, but there's no evidence at all indicating that a Nicotine naive individual and never smoker became addicted to nicotine. That's possible. We cannot exclude that because we don't have studies. But what I can say is the addictive potential is certainly not very dramatic. It becomes dramatic in the combination with other ingredients of tobacco smoke, in particular monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So nicotine releases dopamine and the other constituents block the, the degradation of dopamine. So you have a synergistic action of both. But I don't want to bother you too long with it. Smoking is a disease. We are often confronted with this, that, that smokers are diseased. They have a behavioral disorder. I say smoking is a pleasure-seeking behavior, and smokers are certainly not patients. It's a behavior. It's a behavior, and that's, a, that's the reason why I'm against our randomized control trials to show whether e-cigarettes are efficient in smoking cessation. Efficacy is a term for, for medicinal products and randomized clinical trials were invented. They are very good to find out whether a certain drug is effective or not in the treatment of a disease. But here we are talking about the behavior and to monitor behavioral changes, this is not the place for or the topic for randomized clinical trials. And smoking cessation, of course, I was naive. I didn't understand that I, I re, in the very 
in the beginning, in 2006, I recommended electronic cigarettes for smoking cessation. And immediately, the Austrian government said, okay, that's a, it's a medical, medical thing, and it's not allowed. Because smoking cessation used to be a therapy of patients. This has a, a medical connotation, so it's a therapeutic, therapeutic thing. So when you just stop smoking with electronic cigarettes or with snooze or whatever, you haven't actually, actually stopped really did smoking cessation. And of course dependence is always bad. We have to treat dependence. It's bad irrespective of harmful effects. So this is a kind of ethical, ethical issue. In my opinion, my various addictions and dependencies, I don't tell you about them, yeah? but they are very, very private. I don't tell you in the public. And it's nothing to do with regulators. That's not their job to consider my dependencies as long as I don't harm anybody. I don't harm myself and I don't harm others. Well, the electronic cigarettes are gateway into smoking for minors or adults or whatever. We are, here this, we read this in the media all the time, yeah? And that probably they are debating this this week here in Geneva. Smoking rates of minors, and this is hard data, has declined with unprecedented rates since the appearance of e-cigarettes. I don't claim that a, a causal relationship, but it's very clear that there's no rise in use of electronic cigarettes in minors. I'm talking about this Yule in, in the United States, is just... Uh, I stop because I, I, it's a danger that I get angry. And there's a large body of evidence indicating that electronic cigarettes and snooze are a gateway out of smoking. And so it's also important to open this gateway for minors. I mean, we know that there are 15 to 20 percent of minors who are smoking. And we should offer the possibility of harm reduction also to minors. It shouldn't start at 18. It should start earlier. And that's why I've always been proposing with the age limit to at least, I mean, we need age limits for some reason, but Nicotine replacement products in Austria are free for kids at the age of 12. And that makes sense because one wants to help them when they are smoking, one wants to help them to quit. And so I think the, the age limit for electronic cigarettes should be two years below the age limit of smoking, whatever that is. If it's 18 for smoking, it should be 16 for vaping. Yeah? So we had a chance to, to deviate minors from using cigarettes to electronic cigarettes. There's a minority or minority, about 20% of risk-seeking teenagers and they will always try risky things. Yeah? And they will also try, they try either smoking or vaping. And in my opinion, it's better they try vaping than to try smoking. Okay, what, what else do I have? Electronic cigarettes are tobacco products. We discussed this earlier. This is a crucial point, of course. The, WHO and as well as the FDA classify electronic cigarettes as tobacco products. It's a, I mean, it's easy. You don't have to be a professor of pharmacology to understand the argument against it. Yes. Electronic cigarettes don't contain tobacco. Isn't that easy? Just because it contains nicotine. My example that I always use is when you, when you uh, season your tomato soup with sea salt, the tomato soup doesn't become seafood. <laughs> That's just because there's nicotine in it, there's no tobacco. Okay. And the goal of the WHO is a tobacco-free world. The problem, however, is not the tobacco, but the smoke of burnt burn tobacco. It's the method of tobacco use that's the problem. Yeah? And the goal to eradicate electronic cigarettes and snooze together with combustible cigarettes is I'm try to be polite. I didn't know about the audience here. I'm polite. It's the opposite of reasonable uh, or responsible health policy, in my opinion. Well, and now I, I don't know whether that works. I, could you help me? This is a video. It's just 30 seconds. Maybe you know it. It's from the oh, FDA yeah. anti-vaping campaign, The Real Cost. FDA is not WHO, but there's a We need some. Chemicals like formaldehyde into your bloodstream. It can expose your lungs to acrolein, 
So, this was very short, but it illustrates the warfare that they are dealing with. I mean, I don't think that it's necessary that I comment this kind of propaganda. Instead, I just recommend one of the most awesome videos that are available on YouTube. And it's a conversation about e-cigarettes. Uh, you can listen to Jerry Stimson. He's a professor emeritus from the Imperial College in London. He's a living legend in tobacco, or in harm reduction, general, not only tobacco harm reduction. And there's just one citation out of this video. There's no situation, what he said, in after two minutes or so. There's no situation in which it is safer to smoke than to use an e-cigarette. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the, the basic information that we should dissip dissipate to smokers. We should clearly say that encourage smokers to switch to e-cigarettes. We shouldn't talk about minor health risk, uh, minimal risk that could appear in 30 years. Without fossil quibble, we should clearly communicate that it's safer to use an e-cigarette in every circumstance, even if you have cancer, even if you have cardiovascular disease, even if you are pregnant. It's always better, better to use an electronic cigarette than to, to you. And Finally, I want to stop with a graphic from Christopher Snowden's blog. He allowed me to show this. He posted this in Facebook also. He raised the question whether it will be a good cop with harm reduction, e-cigarettes, health, science, and liberty, or whether it will be a bad cop. Prohibition, black market, junk science, dogma, and the quit or die stance. So with this, it's not up to me to answer this question about the cop. I'm not a cop expert, yeah? but I thank you for your attention. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm open to questions or whatever. Sure. So uh, we'll open up the floor. Uh, any questions to Professor Maya? Uh, obviously, he's been researching this from a toxicological point of view. Uh, any questions you might have on nicotine, any of the effects, uh, anything that he presented? The uh, floor is open for, for questions. We also have open bars. Uh, yes. Yeah, so there's, <laughs> there's drinks uh, that you're able to get at the bar. Please just tell them. Versus science. <laughs> The problem with these events is that they are always friends. It was like the, the meeting that Carmen organized in Barcelona recently. We were celebrating each other, all involved in the Vaco arm reduction. We were friends, we were happy, we had excellent food, everybody was nice, but no critiques. Yeah? Actually, we, we, I would be happy about critical questions. Whenever there are debates, the critics don't come. Maybe you. Hi, yeah. Um, I'm a journalist. I'm with the New York Times. Yeah. And my question is, um, uh, can you interpret the draft proposal that came out from the EU today? Um, do you, do you I haven't seen it. You haven't seen it yet? I was traveling the whole day. Okay. Uh, do you have a card? Can I? I don't have a card. Okay. Well, I just, um, I'm trying to figure out what uh, Really, what it means. If it's but you find find me easily on the web. We can okay. we can connect. You. Yeah, okay. I, I don't have cards That's because my address changes all the time, and so I don't have the money to okay. afford I'll send all these it, cards. I'll send it to you. Yeah, please. Um, yes. Because yes. I'm trying to um, figure out. It's, it's vaguely written, and I can't tell if it's pro harm reduduction or not pro. Harm reduction. <laughs> oh, this is, it's a good news. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, it's easy. In this video, it's very clear. It was not pro. It's, it's very confusing. Um, so. yeah. yeah, I would be happy to answer. Uh, question in the back. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, just because you said you wanted to stick with the question, what's the relation of uh, you um, taking up the uh, How would you answer the clients that you've come in? How are you going to sort of back up your research? Really, that it's uh, uh, loved by big tobacco. Yeah. Okay, first of all, 
I mean, the data clearly show that the smoking, I'm told not to pay to use, the problem, or I start otherwise. The, for the Centers of Disease Control, when they publish data on uh, the paper use of youth, they say it has remained unchanged in the last 10 years. But it's just because they, they count everything as tobacco, including electronic cigarettes, and they don't distinguish between snows, for instance, which are tobacco products, uh, but associated with much less risk. You know this from, from Sweden or Norway. Yeah? But they count everything, and then they say the tobacco use has not changed. So, of course, there, there's a rise. There's a rise in the use of electronic cigarettes among youth. But the amount or the, the fraction of youth that uses either electronic cigarettes or smoking has remained pretty much the same. So there's a switch, actually, in my opinion. There's a switch from the use of tobacco cigarettes to non-combustible products, in particular electronic cigarettes. And the Yule, why is the Yule so successful? Because it contains enough nicotine. And smokers need their nicotine. That's why they are successful. And this is not the not tobacco industry. I mean, very often the tobacco industry is blamed. In fact, they, they didn't even realize the appearance of electronic cigarettes. And nowadays, most smokers, when you that use or ex-smokers that use electronic cigarettes, they don't use products from the tobacco industry. This is minor companies that develop some kind of of atomizers that everybody likes. We have here a colleague you can can watch his this equipment. And I don't think Norbert that any of those is sold by the tobacco industry. No, none, none of them. <laughs> but these are liquids. And beyond smoking cessation, I don't know. They are alternatives. I mean, here we are talking about consumers' choice. It should be free to consumers. I'm not a friend of smoker, of smokers. But even even if somebody decides for himself he wants to, or she wants to smoke, now let him smoke. I mean, they are fighting a war against smokers, vapors, or anything, as if there were no other problems. In particular, teenagers. The second most uh, cause of death of teenagers is suicide. Shouldn't they care about depression among teenagers or ever? I mean, we have other problems than the use of electronic cigarettes by teenagers, in my opinion. I'm <laughs> smoking. Seven years ago, almost seven, six and a half. Baron, I have a question. If, if, uh, just to disclose, I was involved in tobacco control and became a full convert to tobacco harm reduction and can support everything that you said. The one line that bothers me is that nicotine can be a tumor promoter. Can you perhaps tell us, based on which study that statement was made, and how that can be refuted? Yeah. There's one colleague in the United States. He tortured mice with exactly. what is claimed uh, to be the LD50 of mice. Yeah? for an extended period of time and then developed tumors. Because he's convinced, he's a theoretical concept of nicotine causing cancer. And he was <laughs> yeah. I don't know his pre-name now. Yeah. No, I'm not sure, but it's, it's Grando is his name. There's only one. Yeah. And he tried hard to, to prove his, his favorite hypothesis, but obviously he failed and they had to increase the nicotine dose and increase the time he treated mice. There's one caveat actually, and that's there's pretty pretty good evidence that at least in animal experiments and also in cell culture experiments, and that's convincing me that uh, nicotine uh, promotes the growth of blood vessels. So what could happen when the cancer is already established that the cancer growth is accelerated by giving nicotine? Okay. Is that why also they think nicotine is so helpful against Parkinson's? This is different. This is an in inhibition of inflammation. It's an anti-inflammatory agent and also in the brain. So in inhibition and Parkinson is an inflammatory disease. And so this is probably too, it's the same with Alzheimer or also in the stomach. It's the same. There's also this inflammatory bowel disease. Yeah? But in cancer, the growth of, of blood vessels supports the growth of tumors. So there's no evidence in humans, but there is evidence from animal studies there's and it's plausible from the mechanism. I looked at this, I'm, I'm working, I'm doing my research on blood vessels, so at least it's convincing that nicotine, it's conceivable that nicotine has this effect, it's an angiogenic genetic effect. Okay, that's it, uh, by, uh, 
loud, louder, they don't hear. It's, it's the roof of the but is it uh, more helpful? You know, I, I mean, tumor growth, if, if you have cancer, you don't want to have your tumor growing. So when the cancer is already established, I mean, some, sometimes people ask me, they send me an email and said they diagnose, diagnosed cancer. Should I take nicotine or not? Then I tell them to be on the safe side. I mean, it's a matter of dead or, dead or alive, being dead or alive, to be on the safe side, refrain from ni taking nicotine. Even though there's no evidence in humans, again, huh? it's just animal studies and in vitro studies with cultured cells. But it's, it's reasonable to assume that it can do that. If I had cancer, I would stop taking nicotine. Yeah, 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 as many as you want. <laughs> Public health advocates or so-called public health advocates, you know, the anti-tobacco people, so many of them hate these cigarettes because they think the tobacco companies. How are you going to get around that? How are you going to get through that? I don't know. Just telling them, as I said before, most of these products, and there are a lot of vapors here. I see one behind you. And I don't think that you use products from the tobacco industry, do you? No. Listen. And, and, and even if so, and even if so, so what's the problem? I mean, the tobacco industry would be blamed if they start selling oranges. Whatever they sell is evil, then oranges would be banned, probably. Yeah? Do you, uh, uh, today this was a very big day, other than the EU thing, Rand put out a study, I don't know, you probably haven't seen it yet, Rand on a vaping on Juul as uh, leading people to smoke and do Juul. Um, it's fine, everything, I mean, there's one, one claim to public health which is simply not true. It's against common sense and it's not, in this case, not always, no? but in this case, common sense is right. When you reduce the amount of daily cigarette consumption, you reduce your risk. It simply doesn't make sense to say, and sometimes, sometimes the message is transported by the media that it doesn't matter whether you smoke 40 cigarettes a day or one cigarette per day. And that makes a huge difference. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Any other questions in the back? Anyone else? Yes? Okay. Well, we have to... Have another question. Okay. Well, I'll stay here. Yeah, anyway, okay. So, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Blair. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Please feel free to go to the bar, get more drinks, and we'll have the food rolling out here very soon.